Hey guys, I'm Eddie and in this particular video I'm going to go through what it's like to be an intensivist on a day-to-day -day basis. Basically, what my life is like when I hit the door running at my shop. If you're thinking about doing critical care medicine, this just may be your life. So listen up. This video should take eh, possibly a little bit over 10 minutes, but remember, YouTube has a function where if you go to settings, you could actually speed it up to like 1.25, 1.5, or even 2x. I am very grateful for all the support I've gotten over the past couple of videos. Remember to give me a thumbs up if I provided any type of value to you. Subscribe to my channel. Leave comments below. I'm always welcome to, well, I always welcome the opportunity to ask me questions and I'll try my best to get to them in a timely manner. And don't forget to go to my website, www.eddiejoemd.com. I may be a fresh graduate from fellowship training given that it is November 2017 right now and I finished my training in July 2017, well, June 2017. But nonetheless, during the course of my training, I've been provided with an invaluable amount of experience and autonomy from both my residency training program as well as my fellowship training program. So you should look for programs, not necessarily the ones who have the, the sexiest name out there, but in addition to that, you should also look for programs that do allow a good amount of autonomy because that's very important. So what does my day look like? Well, I arrive at my particular shop every day at 8 a.m. Some people might arrive at 7, 6, hey, whatever institution may vary. But when I get there, I'm ready to hit the ground running. There's no time to be wasted. The more productive you are in the beginning, the more time you have at the end. I think that applies for, for most things. This is something that I noticed in the people who trained me. In other words, my attendings when I was a resident, my attendings when I was a fellow, and certain individuals when I was a medical student. As soon as you get there, you gotta be ready to work. You also have to remember that in critical care medicine, at any point in time, the ED is going to call you um, with a patient who needs to be transferred up who's very sick, or the code blue alarm could go off and you have to go address some other issue. So you do not want to have slacked off in the hours before that or the minutes before that, because then some other patient may um, deteriorate or, or you know, may get sicker simply because you did not use your time wisely. So when I get there, I go to my office, get my white code, get my stethoscope, my pager. I don't take those things home with me. I leave them there at the office. And I quickly go and take a lap around the unit. Quick eyeball to the patient through the door. Quick eyeball to the nurse. Let them know you're around in case they need something. Because at that particular time, they're going to give you some very important information. If they need something taken care of, well, you probably take care of it right there or at least have it in the back of your mind that that's something that's of high priority. And so basically a lot of this is, is triage type stuff. Then after I do that, I go and I sit down and, my, and well, basically that takes me just a couple minutes, maybe five minutes maximum. So what I do at that point is then just sit down on the computer and I quickly go through my whole patient list, you know, all my patients one by one and I go through all their vital signs, uh, go through all their labs, review all their medications, look at all their imaging, make sure I'm caught up on the microbiology, make sure that there are no cultures that I, that I might have overlooked because a lot of times the sensitivities, they do pop up in the morning. So you want to be on top of that already. And then what I do at that point is I make some quick notes on all my patients as to what I want to do for them during the day. If I want to extubate them, I write extubate on my piece of paper. And I do have here, I don't know how, how well it's going to show on, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> I don't know how well it's going to show on video, but this is one of my patient censuses and for the sake of hippos, I'm going to fold this like so. And here is my plan for each one of my patients. I have the room numbers here and then I have a little blurb next to them about what my objective is going to be for that day and what my plan is going to be. My goals are here and this is my, well, you know, a lot of those of you who are in residency and whatnot know that you can't lose your piece of paper because your piece of paper is life. This applies to when you're in attending as well. Hate to break it to you, but there's no change. So once I go ahead and I review everything, write everything down, um, I go and I take a walk around the unit again. Once again, this is in the first hour. And if you get very, very efficient at this, it'll be no problem whatsoever. I do it on a daily basis and I'm rarely ever late. Then after I write everything down, I go and I see every patient. And I don't mean do a comprehensive physical exam at that time, but what I do do is I go and I walk into the patient's room 
quickly eyeball the patient, make sure that they're not rowdy or stable, <clears throat> excuse me, crashing and burning, all those things. Take a quick look at the monitor, take a quick look at the vent, and then I go look at the drips that the patient is on. I verify, I, I'm, I'm sorry, this is the way I work. I verify every single medication that the patient is currently getting at that time. Because if they're getting electrolyte replacement, then I know I don't have to do it. I verify every antibiotic, I verify the, every bag of fluid. Also, always wonder why the patient is on maintenance fluids. That's a conversation for a different day, but I'm, I'm not a fan about giving patients maintenance fluids if they have enteral access. One last thing about that first hour is when you go to assess these patients, sometimes you may get bogged down by families. Remember, they are concerned about their loved ones. The patient themselves might need a quick update from you as well. So don't, don't blow these people off because remember, the families and the patients are part of your team. You need to have their buy-in and, and they need to trust you. You can't, you can't be rude to them. That's just not, not a good way to practice medicine. Be kind to these people. Remember, they're the ones who are struggling. You're there making a living. So be kind to your families and to your patients. You could also invite these family members to participate during rounds if, if they feel like they're not getting adequate communication. But obviously, you know, this is up to you. Use your clinical judgment. Some families could obviously not be invited to participate during rounds, but a lot of them can be, and they'll be very grateful. Even if you let them know ahead of time you're going to be talking in medical lingo, you could always clarify it for them a little bit later. And then that concludes my first hour, which is usually a census of between 12 to 20 patients and I can knock that out in an hour. I'm not trying to brag but that's just the way I work and I don't see why you can't accomplish the same. I mean it's not it's not that hard. My second hour is rounding. I like rounding but I don't like those four to six hour rounds that happen in academics. That's one of the reasons why I went into private practice but that doesn't that doesn't prohibit me from teaching. One of the things I love to do, I mean, obviously you can see this YouTube channel and, and things that I'm writing on my webpage is I like to teach. But when I start rounding, I try to explain everything that I'm doing to my team, which includes my nurses, my respiratory therapists, physical therapists, dietitians, so that everybody's on the same page with regards to the goal that we're trying to achieve for that day. Also, critical care nurses and everybody who's involved in critical care is a very high, t high tier of professional. They want to learn. They want to understand. They will read the articles that you give them. So that's something to take into consideration because they're going to love you if you teach. One other little tidbit of when I round is that I don't always go from bed number one to bed number 20. Sometimes you need to switch it up and you know give a patient who has higher priority and go to them first But a lot of times what I do is I go from bed 1 to 20 and then from bed 20 to 1 and you know The number 1 through 20 is obviously a hypothetical your institution may may vary But this allows you to you know the first day you might be exhausted when you get to bed number 20 But on the second day if you start on bed 20 you might catch some things that you may have missed on the first day and like that you kind of switch switch it up and also keep the nurses on their toes because honestly, sometimes the nurses in bed 20 may feel neglected because they, they're the last ones on every single day. So try, try to switch that up a little bit if you can. Now with regards to the case presentation, uh, in academic institutions, you may get the presentation from the student, the resident, the intern, uh, even, even the fellow at some time. But at my shop, we do it with the bedside nurse. Always try to have your RT and your dietitian there so they can provide in input. Obviously, I love my pharmacist because they save my butt on a lot of occasions. Um, even though I do have some sort of background in pharmacy, that's not, you know, that's, that's their job. They help me out with the days of antibiotics. They help me out with dosing and renal patients. They're part of the team. And, and the rounding is a ba basic collaboration. I mean, don't, don't think of it as a chore. Think about everybody getting together to help the patient out as best as they can. Also, when the nurse is giving you input, please take that into consideration. They are with that patient the whole entire day. Me as a physician, I don't spend even a fraction of how much time the nurses spend at the bedside. When there's some sort of change in their mental status or in their vital signs, or even if they have a weird feeling in the bottom of their stomach, pay attention to that because they have some intuition and they, they could uh, give you some information that otherwise you will not pick up on your own if you just swing by three or four times a day. Remember to be thorough. Be very, very thorough. Don't try to not miss anything on your own rounds because then you're going to be playing catch up later. Make sure you reviewed every lab, every radiologic uh, study, 
so you know absolutely everything about your patient. Review all the medications that the patient is on. Remember, you're a medicine doctor. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, you're a medicine doctor, so you should know every medicine that the patient is on and try to get rid of all those medications that, that the patient does not require. If your patient is intubated, make sure that they're being fed. Right now in October 2017, the data is kind of all over the place with regards to when you should initiate feeds, but in my practice, your practice may vary, big disclaimer. I try to feed the patients immediately as soon as they have an OG tube and as soon as their hemodynamics and all that could tolerate it, I start enteral feeds on those patients because everybody needs some cheeseburgers in their life. So the question that you all might be asking is, well, what if an admission comes in, you know, during rounds? At that point, I kind of watch the patient come into the room, quickly eyeball them. Remember that the nurses need some time to kind of tuck that patient in for you. In other words, put the leads on, turn the monitor on, transfer the patient from bed to bed. So these are things that the nurses are going to do. And if you get kind of in their way, you'll, you'll kind of learn how to manage this. But if, if you get in the way, then uh, you might not be met with uh, open arms, so to speak. But if they do need something at that point, they will ask you. So you could quickly go by there, eyeball the patient, kind of know what the patient's clinical baseline is, make sure the IV access is adequate, you know, if the patient's uh, on some sort of breathing machine, whether it's a non-invasive high flow or, or the vent, just make sure that they're oxygenating okay, and then put in some basic orders and get back to rounding. You need to get back to rounding as soon as possible because in my opinion, there's nothing worse than rounding into the afternoon. I mean, it just, it just sucks for everybody involved. Now, if there's an abrupt code or if that patient, for example, on transport self extubates or something and you're in an emergency, well, then you're in an emergency. You gotta drop what you're doing and go take care of that patient. So then rounds are done. How long does it take me to round? Well, obviously it depends on the acuity of the patient, but I usually knock things out in less than two hours. But once I finish, then that's the time where I go examine my patients. And when you examine your patients, you need to be thorough. You need to touch pulses. You need to make sure that, you know, they're perfusing all their extremities and all that, make sure that there's no, uh, major issues that need to be documented. This is also a good time to talk to families. And, and this doesn't mean like a huge sit down conversation. A lot of times you can set up meetings for things like that. Talking to your families is very, very important in the field of critical care medicine. I can't say it's the same in, in other fields, but but you need to earn their trust and respect. A lot of our patients in the ICU are not gonna have good outcomes and they're not gonna have good quality of life. And if the family gets blindsided by this, then they look at you like, you know, where did you go wrong? Instead, you need to let them know about how sick the patient is and the things that cause them to deteriorate. You know, I always tell patients, uh, patients' families that being in the ICU is usually a marathon, it's not a sprint, and that good things take a long time to happen and bad things happen very fast. So, you know, I always mention to pray for the best but prepare for the worst in a lot of cases, and that's just me being completely honest. Um, during the course of the day, make sure you eat something. I usually have some sort of fruits or, or some sort of nuts around because the ICU is unforgiving, and if it gets, if it gets, busy you know you may not eat that day and that's just something as a physician and even nurses for that matter you just need to be aware of it's not all just you know rounding and, and you're done for the day it's, it's it's busy and that's that's what you sign up for and if you don't want to be busy well then go to a different career that's that's just that's just that now note writing note writing sucks I hate, hate, hate writing notes. I hate all this nonsense that the EMRs plug in there, but it's a necessary evil. You know, I'm not saying that writing acute on chronic, hypoxemic, hypercaptic respiratory failure, secondary to acute respiratory distress syndrome, uh, moderate, let's say, it's important because at the end of the day, if something goes wrong with one of your patients, you're gonna be held liable based on that note. And it sucks, because, because, it's, it's the way the system is and I, and I greatly hate it. And people die in the ICU and a lot of times families don't understand why. So they're always gonna think it's your fault. They're not gonna think it's their family member's fault who you know, had stage four COPD, was on three liters of oxygen at all times, was not adhering to, to their OSA treatment and then shows up and is unable to wean off the vent. They, they're gonna think it's your fault and they're not gonna blame their family. So unless you document how sick the patient is, you know, you, you don't have a leg to stand on and, and it's just part of the game. So please be thorough in your notes. I hate it, but I'll be honest with you, you're stuck with it. A way you can make life a little bit more pleasant is to invest some time in putting in like smart phrases or dot phrases. I don't know what your EMR calls it, but 
that saves me time when, when I'm documenting my assessment and plan. So usually after I finish writing my notes or even sometimes during note writing, I might, I might take some time to knock out some procedures and family meetings. They're, they're procedures that could usually wait like a thoracentesis for a pleural effusion or sometimes an A-line or even a central line, but there's some procedures that you have to put higher in your priority and just knock them out. Whenever I do a procedure, one thing that I do is I try to get whatever nursing student or you know MP or, or PA that might be in the unit working with me to come and assist me with the procedure. I like people to get their, you know, like the gym, you gotta get your reps in. Um, that helps them develop confidence in either A, doing the procedure or B, assisting a physician during a procedure. There's nothing worse than having to do an emergency procedure and have a new, new grad nurse who, you know, they want to help you out and try to do a great job, but at the same time, they just don't have the experience. So try to give these people experience so they could do their job and do their job well and do their job efficiently. As you conclude your day, make sure to follow up on everybody's labs who you ordered during the day. Always follow up on the consultant's notes and check what they've written, their suggestions to you if you haven't had the chance to talk to them face to face, which I do recommend you talk to all your consultants face to face. They need to know what you're thinking, you need to know what they're thinking. If they're kind of meh on a decision or you're kind of meh on a decision, then both of you together can help come to a conclusion and, and make a decision that's going to benefit the patient better than one person making all the decisions. Um, try not to leave your night shift person with some sort of scout work. Try to knock out your lines, try to knock out your procedures, um, try to knock out your family meetings because you know the person who's coming on at night, they generally don't have that first interaction or even that second interaction with that family and you don't want them to be blindsided with a bunch of questions that they don't necessarily know the answer to. With regards to sign out, every institution is different. Uh, sometimes it's over the phone, sometimes it's a, you know, a face to face. I tend to be very, very concise with my, with my sign outs. I mean, I don't want to bog down my colleagues with a bunch of information that they don't need to know. Mostly it's like, you know, this patient's sick, this is what may happen, this is a conversation I've had with the family, and go from there. Because at the end of the day, you're gonna be signing out to another intensivist or an NP or a PA who is badass and could do a great job taking care of that patient for you. So that concludes my video on what my day is like in the ICU. Your day may be different. Thank you for watching my video. Please hit the thumbs up button if I provided some sort of value to you, if I taught you something. Uh, comments below, I'll try my best to respond and um, subscribe to my channel, it's growing pretty fast and I'm very, very happy with that. I'm thrilled about it actually. Let me know also in the comments if there's some other video which you would like for me to make. I have a couple of them currently in mind that I'm writing. Never thought of myself as a writer, but I guess that's what I'm doing quite a bit these days. And uh, thanks for watching again. Have a great day.